All right, the God of answered prayer. And good morning to you. Thank you for taking some time out of your day to join me and us for this hour of power. You are tuned into the Preterist Power Hour. This is a podcast ministry provided to you through the Power of Preterism Network, which you can learn more about by visiting powerofpreterism.com. I'm Mike Miano. I serve as the director of the Power of Preterism Network, as well as the pastor of the Blue Point Bible Church. And it's my privilege to be here with you, uh, perfectly walking worthy of uh, those things God has gifted me with, whether it's thoughts, calling, resources, uh, and opportunity to fellowship uh, with you here online. So uh, I'm appreciative of this time. That being said, let's go back and look to our Lord, give him the sacrifice of praise that he desires, and uh, then we'll move in on our hour of power this morning. Mighty God, we thank you for just being a mighty God, for being the wonderful counselor, the the everlasting father, the prince of peace, the uh, Lord of hosts, the many different titles, Lord, that we can use to praise you and look to you and understand you, Lord, as you work in our lives and in our world. Uh, Lord, this morning, we ask that you go before us, that you bless us with insight. Uh, we've been falling back to Genesis. So we ask, Lord, that you would help us understand the beginning, that we might understand the end. Uh, again, this is the Preterist Power Hour. So we do uh, praise you for Preterist truth, fulfillment, Lord. And we thank you that you have shown yourself faithful, that you have deposited your glory within your people, Lord, and you continue to manifest the healing of the nations. So we praise you for that, and we ask you continue to go before us as we walk in it and uh, walk worthy of the things you've provided us with. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, I'm grateful you're here with me. Uh, we love to highlight Monday as a missional Monday. It's a day where hopefully we're stirring ourselves to live out what we learned on Sunday. Uh, yesterday here at the Blue Point Bible Church, I've been preaching through a series called Crazy Corinthians. And in that series, we're looking at the books of Corinthians. And sure enough, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the apostles talk about the foundation of Jesus Christ. And the foundation being Jesus Christ, we are to build upon it. Now, of course, the admonition in 1 Corinthians, or the exhortation, if you will, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, is that we need to be careful be mindful of how we're building upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. And a lot of that has to do with, if not all of it, has to do with true teaching, good teaching, biblical teaching in Christ's church, uh, that we would uh, walk worthy of our calling, that we would examine ourselves to be in the faith, that we would call one another to conviction, uh, that we would seek, search, study, and prove the things of God. So uh, hopefully our program today will do that for you. We'll encourage that mission within you. Uh, I've already mentioned a resource. Please go back if you have some time. Listen to the sermon I preached yesterday. It was a part two of looking at 1 Corinthians 3 in light of a title called uh, God, His Temple and Its Responsibilities. So uh, we're going to have three parts to that, three parts of looking at 1 Corinthians 3. And uh, I encourage you to go back and review those resources. So this morning as I, I woke up, there was a quote that I saw on social media I had posted this years ago uh, from a gentleman named John Stott. John Stott is a, uh, has passed away. However, or has let's properly qualify that uh, he has passed into eternity. And um, John Stott was an evangelical leader. He he was a challenger, though. He he's brought up a lot that had challenged his current day uh, toward reconsidering some of the things they were teaching in the church. Which, uh, as a ever reforming group of people, the church, right? We are to be a uh, semper reformenda ecclesia est is the Latin phrase for the church is to be ever reforming. And uh, we are to do that. So we should praise God as we see that happening in different generations. And John Stott would be one of those teachers that I'm grateful for seeing it uh, be, being brought about in his time. And he said this, whenever the biblical faith becomes unpopular, ministers are sorely tempted to mute those elements which give the most offenses. And as I thought about that, uh, in his day, let me qualify what he's saying there. In his day, he's talking about hell. Uh, John Stott was one of those evangelical leaders that had uh, pop, challenged, excuse me, had challenged eternal conscious torment in his day. And of course, that came with quite a bit of backlash. And uh, what would end up happening is uh, the churches would either be double down on their uh, eternal conscious torment views, obviously, running against what scripture seems to teach, uh, or they would just completely remove teachings of hell from their, their teachings altogether, uh, both being quite problematic. That's muting 
uh, the elements that are giving the most offenses rather than dealing with them, rather than seeking, searching, studying, and proving to the best of our ability. Or to quote a uh, uh, Jeff Durbin, you know, there was a conversation I started recently where I, I cited Jeff Durbin about checking your tradition or to quote Gary DeMar, who says we need to reassess eschatology. And of course, many of you know, being that this is the Preterist Power Hour, um, in our day, we believe that there's a mighty reform happening in regards to eschatology. I'll, I'll speak for myself. I believe that there's a mighty reform happening in Christ's church uh, regarding the uh, you know, the, this truth of eschatology and the power and purpose and presence, it can help us understand. Uh, so um, I believe that many churches, as I don't think I believe it, I know it, many churches are trying to mute that conversation. Uh, even more recently, that discussion I posted with Jeff Durbin and I tagged some other leaders, nobody wants to respond. Nobody wants to be held to a consistency on the things that they're teaching in regards to eschatology, which is sad and problematic. And just shows, uh, you know, uh, the need for reform in Christ's body in His church. So, uh, that being said, uh, we've prayed in. I want to go ahead and bring us into the scriptures a bit this morning, which is the way we should always be figuring out our view. Amen. Uh, the scripture should be our very foundation. We know. I love what Martin Luther had said, and it's interesting because this month we celebrate Martin Luther and his reforms, the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther, when he was testifying before the Diet of Worms, uh, and often quoted. Uh, phrase was that he, and I'm going to paraphrase here, was that the confessions and the creeds often have errors. Therefore, we must stand upon or we must seek what the scriptures teach because the scriptures are our foundation. And he had said, uh, I forget the exact way he said it, but he said, you know, here I stand, you know, uh, looking to the scriptures, you know, for the truth. And, you know, again, I'm paraphrasing, but that should be our goal. And this month is a great opportunity to remind us of that as we look toward Reformation Day, uh, which will be Sunday, October 30th this year, uh, the last Sunday of the month, we'll be celebrating here at Blue Point. I believe it's a great opportunity for us to highlight the need for reform in the church and, the, and not only the need for it, God's constant provision of providing it. He provides reform. We don't believe that this is our effort or that we deserve praise for anything. We believe that this is God initiating something. Um, matter of fact, before I bring us to uh, Exodus 33, um, I'll say this. Many times I get asked, you know, do you believe that the, the church not having a good eschatology, right, that, that we see a lot of these different views fumbling uh, to be consistent, do you believe that that's the work of God? And obviously many would want to cleave to the verse where God is not the author of confusion. Uh, I think a lot of times those things are misunderstood. And I would just say that God has led his church, his, has led people into confusion. We've seen the Old Testament, that was, he confounded his people intentionally uh, so that they would have the need for the Messiah, that we read about that in the book of Galatians. So I do believe God leads people into confusion, ultimately to teach them lessons, to allow them to uh, discern things, to see the need for discernment. And uh, that being said, I do believe that God is in charge. He's sovereign over what's happening in his church. And I don't believe the church has uh, erred in regards to our foundation. The church has testified since the first century that it's Jesus Christ who is our Lord. That message has never been lost from Christ's true church. Now, how you would piecemeal that and make that work out, you know, what's his true church? Uh, I don't really encourage the divisiveness. I encourage a much broader view of Christ's church. Uh, ultimately, what I'm reading in 1 Corinthians chapters 1 through 3 uh, in my, my sermon prep. So, that being said, uh, I believe God's in charge of what's happening in his church, and I believe God is doing something mighty in this day and age, urging his people to seek, search, study, and prove uh, what the, where the, where what and where the presence of God is and where it can be found, and ultimately what the purpose of God is and where that can be found in his church. So just some thoughts this morning uh, in regards to preterism and the power of it, you know, and I hope that uh, you see that happening uh, in his church and that you don't believe that the church is confused. The church is in need of reform. It's always been need of reform since the first century. How many times do you see in the New Testament literature where they're rebuking churches and telling them, you know, you need to shape up. You need to be mindful of how you're building on the foundation of Jesus Christ. There's nothing wrong with that charge. And we shouldn't be dismayed that that's our, our reality. Again, there I say this, that's a personal reality. You know, we are sanctified in Christ. We are glorified in Christ. Amen. However, let us not think that we are not in need of reform. Just yesterday, I preached to our congregation about kindness. And if I might add this, I, I thought, you know, I, I'm a kind guy. I got a one-up on kindness. I'm, I'm just, nobody would say, I'm, you know, I'm not kind. 
And then I thought about it and I said, well, maybe you would say you're not kind. <laughs> uh, you know, maybe you know, and I do. I examine myself and I know I need to increase in kindness. So while I believe God has given me everything pertaining to life and godliness, I know there's need to possess and increase, uh, which again is mentioned in 2 Peter chapter 1. So um, I, I urge us toward that. I urge us toward reform personally, individually, as well as corporately. And I pray you, you do that with me and you praise God with that, uh, for, with me for that in his church. So let's go ahead and bring our attention over to the Parshat readings. Uh, Exodus chapter 33 is the uh, Torah reading for the Jewish community this week. And again, a lot of this, this is from the, um, the Parshat. Uh, oh, I forgot it now. It's, um, it's basically an addendum in addition to the normal Parshat readings. So if you were going through a commentary, for example, I use Jonathan Sachs commentary on the Parshats. If you were going through it, you'd say, why is the Parshat for this week not mentioned in the ordinary commentary? And the reason being is that uh, due to the holiday, right? You see, we're in the Feast of Tabernacle right now. Uh, due to the holiday, and they often insert a, a, on holidays, you do different things. You know, let's just call it what it is. I often teach that. And um, what the Jewish community does is inserted a reading that is about the intermediate days, the uh, Sabbaths within the, um, the Sabbaths within the, uh, the feasts of, pardon me, I'm sorry, um, the feast of Yom Kippur, or I'm sorry, the feast of, the, the feast of Passover and the feast of uh, Tabernacles. Both of them are pretty much week long festivals and they have intermediate days uh, in the middle where they're not necessarily festival days, but their days are part of the feast. So uh, just a little bit of a tidbit there about the, uh, the, the Parshat this week. The reading that they read through would be Exodus 33, verse 12 to Exodus 34, verse 26. And I'm going to go ahead and read that to us and then share some thoughts and maybe even explain why I think this is beneficial to what we're doing here on the Preterist Power Hour. Join me in Exodus 33, verse 12. Then Moses said to the Lord, see thou, you, see, thou does say to me, bring up this people, but thou thyself has not let me know whom you will send me with. Moreover, you have said, I have known you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray, if I have found favor in your sight, let me know your ways, that I may know you so that I may find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence shall go with you and I will give you rest. Then he said to him, if my presence does not, then he said to him, that's Moses said to God, if your presence does not go with us, do not lead us up from here. For how then can it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and this people? Is it not by you going with us so that we, I and your people may be distinguished from all the other people who are upon the face of the earth. And the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing which you have spoken, for you have found favor in my sight, and I have known you by name. Then Moses said, I pray, show me your glory. And he said, I will myself make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim my name, the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to those whom I will be gracious, and I will show compassion on those who are who I will show compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man can see my face and live. Then the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me, and you shall stand there on the rock, and it shall come about when my glory is passing by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away, and you shall not, and you shall see my back, but my face you shall not see. Now the Lord said, uh, chapter 24 here, now the Lord said to Moses, cut out for yourself two stone tablets like the former ones, and I will write on the tablets the words which were on the former tablets, which you shattered. So be ready by morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on top of this mountain. And no man is to come up with you, nor let any man be seen anywhere on the mountain. Even the flocks and the herds may not graze in front of that mountain. So he cut out two stone tablets like the former ones, and Moses rose up early in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him, and he took two stone tablets in his hand. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, 
and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he will be by no means, he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. And Moses made haste to bow to blow toward the earth and worship. And he said, if now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, I pray, let the Lord go along in our midst, even though the people are so obstinate and do pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us as your own possession. Then God said, behold, I am going to make a covenant before all your people. I will perform miracles which have not been produced in all the earth, nor among any of the nations and all the people among whom you live will see the working of the Lord. For it is a fearful thing that I am going to perform with you. Be sure to observe what I am commanding you this day. Behold, I am going to drive out the Amorite before you and the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Watch yourselves that you make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land which you are going, lest it become a snare in your midst. But rather you are to tear down the altars, smash their sacred pillars and cut down their ashram. For you shall not worship any other God. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they play the harlot with their gods, and sacrifice to their gods, and someone invites you to eat of his sacrifice, and you take some of his daughters and your sons, and his daughters play the harlot with their gods, and cause your sons also to play the harlot with their gods. You shall make for yourselves no molten gods. You shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread. For seven days you are to eat unleavened bread, as I commanded you and appointed at the month of Abib. For in the month of Abib you came out of Egypt. The first offspring from every womb belongs to me, and all your male livestock and first, er first offspring from cattle and sheep. And you shall redeem with a lamb the first offspring of the from a donkey. And if you do not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. You shall redeem all the firstborn of your sons, and none shall appear before me empty-handed. You shall work six days, but on the seventh day you shall rest. Even during plowing time and harvest, you shall rest. And you shall celebrate the Feast of Weeks. That is the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the Feast of Ingathering at the turn of the year. Three times a year, all your males are to appear before the Lord God, the God of Israel. For I will drive out nations before you and enlarge your borders. And no man shall covet your land when you go up three times a year to appear before the Lord your God. You shall not offer blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread, nor is the sacrifice of the feast of Passover to be left over until morning. You shall bring the first, very first of the first fruits of your soil into the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a kid in his mother's milk. And that's the end of our reading. So, again, what stood out to me, of course, would be where we see Moses saying that this people are your people who are you've set apart to see your glory, to manifest your presence, to know you. And uh, I find this interesting. And the reason why I wanted to have us read this was in the Jewish parshats right now, they just started their new year. They began with Deuteronomy 32, which again, we know is the song of Moses. Moses calls heaven and earth to account, reminds them of their judgments, reminds them of their covenant reminds them of the blessings and the curses that will come upon them for disobedience. And uh, that was the first reading of the year, Deuteronomy 32. Then, sure enough, today, this week is a new week, and now we're in the second week of the year, and we're reading what? The covenant that was given at Sinai. And sure enough, this should not surprise you, next week, we're going to end up where? In Genesis 1 through 6. And you're going to read that, and you're going to say, this is the beginning of the covenant, hopefully. As many of you know, that's what I teach, and we've provided a host of resources at this point. So now let me demonstrate something. And by the way, Tim Martin continues to be an excellent resource, and I have four sermons still uploaded, waiting for constant review um, about God's garden, Genesis 1 through 3, for that matter. And what Tim had said that I mark out of significance was that the garden story is an immaturity story. It's a story of a young people, a child. That's told, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Not give an explanation why, just told not to do it. Listen. And then if you notice now, let's build up. Let's go backward to go the right way again. So we just went from Deuteronomy to Genesis. Now let's look at what Genesis to Deuteronomy shows us. 
So if we see a maturity happening in Genesis 1 through 3, we see the beginning of this covenant. It's not actually even a covenant yet. It's sort of like a child is not a man yet, right? So uh, you see the beginning of the covenant. And then here in Exodus, what do we see? This is the covenant. I'm going to make a covenant with you. And he gives them the law of Moses, which builds upon do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now they have explanation as to what they're not supposed to do. Do not go among the nations to start making treaties. Why? Because they're going to cause you to worship their gods. They're going to cause you to give your children over. Your children are going to end up worshiping their gods. Excuse me. And then by the time we get to Deuteronomy 32, now Moses is, is frustrated. He knows that the people of the land are, that, that their generation was disobedient to what was revealed here in Exodus. And now he's prophesying toward the next generation. And we know he's even prophesying toward what? The last days that they will be a wicked and crooked generation. I think I said that out of order, but uh, evil and perverse generation. Um, and we talked a little bit about that on uh, Friday last week and throughout last week about the par shots. Uh, in regards to Deuteronomy 32. So matter of fact, I'll probably be sharing a blog this week to kind of build upon these thoughts to show you this progression. Uh, So again, hopefully you're seeing, if you read backwards from Deuteronomy, what Genesis chapters one through three is talking about becomes rather evident. You know, and I've often challenged folks to read back from the end of the Old Testament to the beginning and ask yourself, well, then what is the beginning about? If the end is all about Israel and this covenant that they disobeyed and their need for a Messiah, Does that not help you reflect upon what's going on in the Garden of Eden when they're given a law and they violate the law? And then what's what's told in Genesis 3.15? We call that the proto-evangelion, the beginning of the gospel, prior to the gospel. And sure enough, there's told that uh, one of their descendants, their descendant, the seed of the woman, will crush the head of the serpent. The serpent will bruise the heel of the, the woman's descendant. And we know that that's a messianic prophecy. So we see the gospel there. We see the gospel all throughout the law, that it will become, they will not be these people that can manifest the glory of the Lord, that can be these people that have his presence, that the nations can look to and learn about God, which is the very reason he explains in Deuteronomy 4, that he gave them the covenant. So, you know, I'm hoping you're seeing this, and I just find it beautiful. I'm excited that the Jewish community is doing this backwards reading, if you will, an informed reading into Genesis, and I encourage us to follow along. I encourage you to follow along and be blessed by uh, these truths as they're constantly being unraveled. So um, that being said, uh, that's the Parshat reading for the week. Of course, you can go ahead and read the prophet. Um, actually, let's go ahead and do that. Let's take a moment here. We're going to go over to Ezekiel chapter 38. The Jewish community marks out two readings. They'll do the, the Torah reading and then the Haf Torah reading, which is the prophetic reading. And here in Ezekiel 38, Now, we know Ezekiel is a prophet that was during the Babylonian captivity. Uh, There's different, you know, I haven't gotten into the study I would like to on the book of Ezekiel uh, in more recent years uh, to remind myself and refresh my thoughts about the historical context. Uh, But I know there's some that would argue for a post, pre, or even during Babylonian captivity uh, authorship of Ezekiel's prophecies. Um, So that being said, uh, we know they have context within that 5th, 6th BC time, uh, and also, of course, prophetic context to the first century. Uh, Here in Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 18, and we've covered this, so this should be a good refresher for us. Uh, We talked about Gog and Magog before here on our program. So let's start at verse 18, and we're going to read through to chapter 39, verse 16. And it will come about on that day when Gog comes against the land of Israel, declares the Lord God, that my fury will mount up in my anger. And in my zeal and in my blazing wrath, I declare that on that day, there will surely be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. And the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and the beasts of the field, all the creeping things that creep on the earth and all the men who are on the face of the earth will shake at my presence. The mountains also will be thrown down to the steep pathways and they will collapse and every wall will fall to the ground. And I shall call for a sword against him on my mountain declares the Lord God, every man's sword will be against his brother. And with pestilence and blood, I shall enter into judgment with him. And I shall rain on him and his troops and on the many peoples who are with him, a torrential rain with hailstone, fire and brimstone. And I shall magnify myself, sanctify myself and make myself known in the sight of many nations. And they will know that I am the Lord God. And you son of man prophesy against God and say, 
Thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against you, O Gog, Prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. And I shall turn around and drive you on, take you up from the remotest parts of the north and bring you against the mountain of Israel. And I shall strike you, your bow from your left hand and dash down your arrows from your right hand. You shall fall on the mountains of Israel and all your troops and the people who are with you. I shall give you as food to every kind of predatory bird and beast of the field. You will fall on the open fields, for it is I who have spoken, declares the Lord God. And I will send fire upon Mag Magog and those who inhabit the coast, coastlands in safety, and they will know that I am the Lord. And I'm, in my holy name, I shall make known in the midst of my people Israel. And I shall not let my holy name be profaned anymore. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Behold, it is coming, and it shall be done, declares the Lord God. That is the day of which I have spoken. Then those who inhabit the cities of Israel will go out and make fires with the weapons and burn them, both shields and bucklers, bows and arrows, war clubs and spears. And for seven years, they will make fires of them. And they will take wood from the field. They will not take wood from the field, excuse me. Or gather firewood from the forest, for they will make fires with the weapons, and they will take the spoil of those who despoiled them, and seize the plunder of those who plundered them, declares the Lord God. And it will come about on that day that I shall give Gog a burial ground there in Israel, the valley of those who pass by the east of the sea, and it will be a it will block the passerby, so that they will bury Gog there with all his multitude, and they will call it the valley of Haman Gog. For seven months the house of Israel will be burying them in order to cleanse the land. Even all the people of the land will bury them, and it will be there. It will be renowned on that day. I glorify myself, declares the Lord God. And they will set apart men who will constantly pass through the land, burying those who are passing through, even those left on the surface of the ground, in order to cleanse it. And at the end of seven months, they will make a search. And as those who pass through the land pass through, and anyone sees a man's bone, then he will set up a marker by it until the buriers have buried it in the valley of Haman God. And even the name of the city will be Hamona, and they will cleanse the land. I'll tell you, <laughs> some interesting stuff happening here. Um, I don't know about you, but when I read through the first couple of verses, I thought, interesting, verse 20, uh, 38, verse 20. The fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beast of the field, the creeping things on the creeping earth, and all the men who are on the face of the earth will shake at my presence. The mountains also will be thrown down. I don't know about you. That sure sounds like creation language to me. I mean, the, the beast of the field, where do you find that language other than Genesis 1 and 2? Uh, you know, it's, prophet, it's used in prophetic language. What I loved about the book, Beyond Creation Science, was they had two chapters. One chapter denoting the apocalyptic style of Genesis, and then another chapter uh, detailing the prophetic style of Genesis. So once we admit that Genesis is apocalyptic and prophetic, we can begin to see the way the language is actually being used. And uh, this should show you that the prophets, in talking about the covenant God had with Israel, whether it was the building up of the covenant or the breaking down of that covenant, the judgment of that covenant, they use what? Creation language. So now that we know that, we go back to Genesis and we say, oh, so is it possible that the way Genesis is being written, rather than the natural way men have been reading it, is it possible it's an apocalyptic and prophetic text pointing to early covenant details? And I believe that's just rather simple. Uh, that's why, you know, I love that the Jewish community is marking out these texts. Uh, then, of course, Gog and Magog, I believe, I encourage you to go back, look at our resources that we've provided here on the Preterist Power Hour. Uh, we marked out that Gog and Magog, or even now look at the other term that was introduced, Haman. We know that these are images of the enemies of God. The enemies of God would come under God's judgment. And what we saw here in Ezekiel 38 was that God is going to use the enemies to come against Israel. And then in that picture, we should be seeing that that's the time of judgment. And sure enough, we know first century, you know, Jesus says, what to Jerusalem? When you see the cities gathered, and sure enough, there's, a, again, interesting etymology between um, Haman Gog or uh, this valley of, um, yeah, the valley of Haman Gog and uh, what we call Armageddon or the valley of Megiddo, Megiddo, you know, again, just interesting uh, correlations and etymology between the terms. And um, again, it's an evil place. Uh, by the time the valley of Megiddo would have represented by the time of the first century, uh, they would have understood this was a place where idolatry happens, where it's just a place that reeks of death. Uh, 
and I don't know about you, and hopefully I, you are familiar with this, Haman was one that wanted to exterminate the Jews in the time of Esther. So uh, this language is constantly pointing out the enemies of the people of God. They would come forth a time of judgment, again, and hopefully, let me stop saying hopefully. <laughs> um, as you get to Ezekiel, you should know that Israel has become, the people of Israel, that the flesh and blood covenant had at that point become enemies to the, you know, the covenant. They had defiled the covenant all the way up. Of course, we're going to see by the time of the first century where Jesus Christ does what? He says, by your traditions, you have invalidated the word of God. They violated the covenant. And that's why judgment was coming upon Jerusalem in the first century. So hopefully you're seeing a lot of this language. That's what I'm hoping out of this. And uh, I encourage us to continue studying it out. And we will have discussion here in a moment. So if anyone has some thoughts you want to share in that regard, I look forward to you sharing. A couple other resources I want to mention before I bring us in on some discussion would be uh, this past weekend, Brother Lynn Hiles, Dr. Lynn Hiles participated in a conference in Missouri, uh, the Victorious Eschatology Conference. Uh, I'm going to be reaching out to him, uh, obviously sharing some resources with us. Uh, you can access the, the conference on Lynn Hiles' YouTube page. So that's one way I could tell you offhand. However, I'm looking to kind of provide a, uh, a resource where you can just go and find all the different lectures from that uh, conference. And of course, we'll be uh, hoping to have some interviews and discussion with Dr. Lynn Hiles, as well as others that participated in that conference. And uh, that's one resource for this pet from this past weekend. Uh, two other resources I'll make mention of. Uh, Bruce Bennett, I debated him back in 2014. And uh, Bruce had a conference this past week. He holds a conference every year like we do at Blue Point. And he held his conference this year, the 13th annual conference, uh, talking about biblical account of origins. And I thought it was interesting because we're looking at that topic. So uh, I asked him if he had the videos. He told me they can be found on his church Facebook page. That's the word of truth. And while I'm not sure that I would agree with everything that, uh, that Bruce Bennett has brought out uh, or the teachers that were there at his conference, um, I think it's a worthy resource to look into. So I'm going to be doing that. I might be bringing out some details during the week. Wanted to afford you the opportunity to go and look for yourself. And who knows, maybe we can stir some conversation with Bruce. Maybe we can stir some conversation with those that spoke at his conference and uh, see how that will lead in on what we're talking about here as we fall back to Genesis. And then the third resource uh, throwback here would be uh, last year around this time. Matter of fact, it was this past weekend, uh, the 8th through the 10th. Today's the 10th. So it was actually today as well. Uh, we had our 2021 Not One Stone Left Bible Conference here at Blue Point, and uh, we had great, you know, great speakers, Ward Fenley, Daniel Rogers, uh, myself, Edward Howell was a presenter, uh, many, you know, Deacon Ed, um, we pray for Deacon Ed, and, um, you know, so we had many great speakers, and uh, we encourage you to go back. I had preached a sermon on the eighth day living in the fulfilled eschaton and how we should understand that. Uh, obviously looking at the eighth day that would be celebrated at the end of Feast of Tabernacles, which we're currently talking about and going through. I have a lot to say about that. As many of you know, more recently, I had some discussion with Steve Magua, Pastor Steve Magua, in regards to Tabernacles as well. So uh, there's a lot that I could put into that discussion, but I encourage you go back and visit my sermon that I preached about the eighth day uh, last year, and I think you will be blessed. Last couple of thoughts. As I looked at my phone, I had some resources regarding Genesis from this time a couple of years ago, about three years ago, and I just wanted to stir your thoughts with this. And this is where I'm at in my understanding of creation and how that relates to the rest of the Bible in a narrative fashion. Rather than viewing Genesis, creation, and what God calls good as the beginning of universal physical creation, we should understand the context and the clues that speak to a covenantal, recreative, and restorative creation. And interestingly enough, three years ago, we were a part of a study. It was a study with a bunch of churches in our area, and they had us read a book called The Universal Christ. I believe it was by Richard Rohr. And uh, this book taught universalism, which I don't agree with. And uh, what I noticed was that there was a lot of charge to look at the creation account as a universal creation account, which unfortunately many presuppose when they read Genesis chapters one through three. Well, then let's consider how that works with the rest of the narrative. So if God starts in the beginning you, by being universal relating to all creation, then he has to end. His restoration would be the same thing. And many unfortunately have gone that route. However, when we begin to understand for us, we're a bit biased, which is a good bias, uh, 
that we understand the end, right? We've seen the time statements, we've seen the context, we've studied it out, we've seen the value, the power of preterism. So that, of course, charges us to go backwards and look at Genesis, which again, mentioning the parshots, the Jewish community is doing it. So why wouldn't we do that? Why wouldn't we agree that that's a good, healthy hermeneutic to go back now with the information you've attained as an informed perspective? So we go back to Genesis and uh, we see this, this picture. So again, I would say, as I wrote here, is God's grace universally revealed through all creation or or is God's grace restorationally revealed through his church? Uh, and I would say, of course, Ephesians 3.10 being a text I often bring up, the manifold wisdom of God is made known through the church. That's God's goal. That's God's purpose. So I don't believe now taking that informed logic, I don't go back to Genesis and say that God started out revealing it universally. I believe that it's always been covenant creation. It continues to be covenant creation, uh, that God makes known his truth and his grace. So, um, you know, that's what I have for us today. I hope that you've been blessed. I'm going to find out if the folks that are here with me, at least, were blessed. And, uh, of course, uh, any other thoughts you want to bring up, I welcome uh, in regards to this creation conversation. And uh, I might mention, I've given you some conference reviews. I've um, mentioned Tim Martin's sermons also, so we're going to be uploading those. And, uh, yeah, so there's much more uh, resources. I want to thank, by the way, before we go into discussion, I do want to thank, uh, I received some comments on our YouTube channel, and uh, there's a, a page called uh, Understanding the Bible, and uh, I believe the brother's name is Dallas, and he's been leaning in on covenant creation in his videos on YouTube, uh, again, to a better understanding the Bible is the name of the YouTube channel, and um, I'm looking forward to leaning in on some of his uh, resources. He has some stuff about heaven and earth. He has a Genesis, uh, the garden, uh, the seven days of prophecy, uh, marking out the seven days and how they're understood prophetic and apocalyptically. So I haven't reviewed those resources, but I thank him for being a part of uh, the discussion on our videos. And we look forward to, uh, again, I'll share the resource and we'll welcome some discussion in that regard. I'm going to unmute the mic. So if you gentlemen want to jump in here, please feel free and uh We'll open up some discussion. Pastor, what was the um, uh, the chapters in Deuteronomy we started off with? Um, last week's reading? No, no, today. Today we did Exodus, Exodus 33. Oh, it was Exodus. That's why, that's why I couldn't find what I was looking for. So it was Exodus 33, you said? Yes, starting at verse 12. Let me see. Exodus... 33 at verse 12. Okay. So I, I believe it was Exodus, and then we read some of Exodus 34, right? Yes, up to verse 26. Okay. Because I, I believe it was 34 11 that caught my eye. Let me see if that's the one that I was really looking for. According to. No, I, it might be uh, 3311. Uh, let me see. So the Lord used to speak to Moses' face. Mm, I can't find what I was looking for. Do you remember uh, what the topic was? No, that's why I, went, I needed the verse to trigger my thought. <laughs> All right. And then, we, and then after, after, after we went, through Exodus, we went to Ezekiel, right? Yes. And that would and that would be Ezekiel. Ezekiel 38, 18. This is going to be one of those times, my brother, where I'm going to tell you this is why it's good to have a hard copy of that Bible in front of you. Yes, really. You said 18? Yes, 38.18 to 39.16. Okay, because I know you already spoke about Magog and, and then um, Hamangog. So mm -hmm. I, I, I guess you have reiterated that, you know, that, uh, that Haman uh, was considered uh, an enemy of God's people because he wanted to eliminate all of the Jewish people, you know, and then Haman being a, uh, a descendant of Amalek, which is uh, a descendant from Gog uh, or something like that, or Magog, one of them. So, yeah. 
you know, and then the enemies of God, how they got destroyed in uh, the revelation, I believe. Yeah, again, we have a resource already provided on that. Yes, so, exactly. Out there. Yeah. yeah. What I, in my, when I was reading through Ezekiel, what I wanted us to see, and what I believe the Jewish community is urging folks to see themselves, is the language that's being used to talk about this judgment of the covenant. That, again, notice it's the creation language, the beast of the field, the creeping things on the face of the earth. Uh, this is stuff we read in Genesis. So we see the prophets using that language to talk about a judgment of a covenant. So then why wouldn't we understand the beginning of the covenant in the same way when they're using that language? So I, I know what, what triggered my thought um, when, when, when you were talking about the, uh, the judgment coming upon Israel, you know, instead of the whole world. Because uh, in, in, some, in some of the reading, um, it was, how do they say, um, too much is given, much is required. So Israel was given the oracles of God. That's why they were required, you know, where judgment came upon them, you know, instead of the whole world, because they were the ones to determine, you know, the direction of the world as far as them being that influence. If they were blessed, you know, the nations were blessed. If they were under curse or they were in darkness, the nations around them would be in darkness. So they were held accountable. Like in other words, the blood was on their hands. You know, so they had to, you know, uh, be judged according to, you know, their disobedience and their breaking of covenant. Amen. Amen. So, again, I think you, you, you would agree with me. You see the similarity between the language. Yes. And then I like the language, you know, how, how they spoke of the, the, uh, the, the creatures, the birds of the air and of the heavens and all of this, you know. Because how, how they're speaking of, uh, of nations and peoples, you know, and uh, how that will reflect in Genesis, you know, I, I, I want to learn so much more about that. You know? <laughs> I might say this, another correlation that I saw in the reading would be that let, Exodus 33 through 34, you saw that the goal of the covenant is that God would be glorified, that his glory would be with his people, that his people would know his glory uh, and that they would show him to the, you know, the world around them. And then when you get to Ezekiel, Ezekiel saying that this judgment is all about the Lord, in a sense, uh, redeeming his name from being defiled, right? He says there in the beginning of the judgment that his name will be defiled no longer. So we see the whole goal of what we read in Genesis, what we read in Exodus, what we read in Ezekiel, is all about the Lord's glory. And as you know, you know that's the very, the presence the presence of God in our lives manifests his glory. That should be evident from what we're reading this morning. Then it should also help us understand his purpose. If his people have his presence, his people make his presence known to the world, which thereby is known to all, which is what his purpose and uh, which the purpose of scripture is, that God would be glorified by his people. Right. So his name would no longer be, you know, uh, dishonored right. through Jesus Christ. Uh to whereas that's where the change had occurred as far as, you know, uh, uh, the people being where they should be instead of, you know, uh, breaking covenant and all of this, you know, uh, we're in an everlasting covenant today. Right. Amen. All right. Well, again, we're, this is our falling back to Genesis. So I want to keep us on track here. We're really, we're right. our goal. You know, we understand these things about the covenant, the judgment of Israel. Hopefully you're there. You know, we're preterists and we're taking our fall back to. So, um, Edward, I don't know. This, this week, did you find opportunity to look at any of the resources we provided? Uh, if you go to our blog site, we have quite a few mentioned there. Uh, did you time find time to go into any of those? No, I had not. Um, you normally give me some good stuff with your updates, which I which I kept. Um that I can go through them, um, but I have not not the opportunity actually as of yet. Well, saying that to you, I want to go ahead and open this up to everyone else that's listening and following along. If you go to our website, powerofpreterism.wordpress.com, that's our blog. Our main site is powerofpreterism.com. But if you go to the WordPress site, if you look here on the screen, what I'm sharing with you is uh, how you can obtain the most updated resources for this discussion, to follow along, to contribute, would be to go to the two most recent blogs. You have 
uh, Falling Back to Genesis. And if you click on Falling Back to Genesis, uh, there's some thoughts from me, of course. And then I bring you in on uh, some blogs that I've written, an introduction to covenant creation, which those of you that know my ministry know my resources are full of resources. That's what I do. I pull together, you know, that's how I study. I love to pull together information and kind of go through all of it. So if you go to Intro to Covenant Creation, there's enough for you to study at that link alone for probably the next, the whole fall season, just to let you know that. However, if you say, you know, I wanted, I've already looked at all of that. Maybe you've been following me for years and you followed through most of my, my work. Uh, then there's some other resources I provided. Um, this is bringing you to uh, the more recent discussions we had back in February regarding preterism and Genesis. So uh, you could go to those links. And again, that's some uh, discussions with Jeff Vaughn, Tim Martin, Randy Nuss. The whole reason we're doing this now is we know there's so much more to study through and talk about. So uh, then I have Tim Martin teaches.wordpress. There's four sermons uploaded there. I'm looking uh, in the next week, couple of weeks to just do a whole you know, uh, throwing a whole bunch of sermons on there for everyone to begin to dive into. And we're going to have a discussion with Tim where he's going to tell us you know, a great way to go about these studies. I do encourage you to exhaust the four sermons that are already there, go through them, review them. Uh, you will be blessed. And then uh, another recent study I had posted back in June of this year, I was a guest on the Harry Ticks uh, variety show, and I was able to outline covenant creation. And instead of providing a link where you can listen to that, what I did instead was I actually gave you my whole outline. So you can see uh, how I taught on that. That link's available for you. We are looking forward to having some discussion with Elvin Israel in regards to his book, The Circumcision and Uncircumcision of Genesis 1, uh, The Mysteries of the Garden Revealed. So we'll be uh, looking to talk with him. And then, of course, as we've mentioned, Jeff Vaughn. Uh, Jeff Vaughn presented most recently. That would probably be our most recent resource that we've brought up. Uh, Jeff Vaughn presented at the 2022 Spirit and Life Lectures, and there was some discussion with uh, with Holger Neubauer uh, in that regard. So maybe we're looking to talk with both of them about maybe some further study that they've had uh, since that discussion. So that's just a host of resources there. Then, as of this past Friday, uh, October 3rd, I posted another resource for us. Uh, that was our Flashback Flash Forward Friday. And there you can listen to Friday's program, uh, we also talked quite a bit about the Feast of the Lord, which continues to be a discussion. Uh, I encouraged you to go to that resource I just mentioned, fall back to Genesis. And then, of course, Tim Martin teaches. So and then there was uh, all the different other conversations that we're having. Not one stone left the throwback Thursday review there, et cetera. So there's a lot that you can get into. Uh, I namely heard uh, in, in the audience here. I want to let you know. I namely encourage us for the program here to be looking at the Genesis resources. Uh, for your own edification, I would encourage you to go and look at the Victorious Eschatology Conference, uh, you know, and, and um, even the Not One Stone Left. That's more of personal edification uh, to build us up, you know, in the preterist view. You know, our goal is to take a more mature look back to Genesis. So, um, yeah. So, again, I, I mentioned quite a few resources. I hope that you'd uh, dive in on, on them, Edward, and all of you that are you said there. like fall back to Genesis and, and those like resources. Yes. Okay, I have that in your uh flashback fast flash forward Friday credits power hour. Those resources right. you have it in there, and you have quite a few. Okay, yes, I'll, I'll get into that. All right, good deal. And might I say, for uh, and Zach, uh, hopefully, if you're, you're wanting to unmute, you're more than welcome. Um, you know, I'll say this uh, as I close out our program, I will say, um what we'll do for this week is look at some of those Genesis resources and hopefully, you know, we'll have some information to share this coming Friday. And by this Friday, I will let all of you know, I'll have some interviews lined up. I'll have some other ideas for our program uh, to kind of advance us uh, in this study. So I don't want you to think that we're just talking about Genesis and not necessarily diving into some of the things, the details, that the, the weeds, so to speak. Uh, so please look forward to that and mark out the things that you feel are necessary in this discussion as well. So um, that being said, Edward, unless you have anything else you wanna bring up to demonstrate the power and progress of preterism will bring us to a close and I'll excite everyone with uh, a future a blog being uploaded a bit later today uh, with a bunch more, a reminder of many of the resources we've mentioned. Well, being that I, I wanna, you know, uh, have more detailed information about Genesis to discuss, I'm gonna go through, uh, that Genesis thing that I mentioned, and, and you, I, you also have the Tim Martin there too. So I'm going to get into both of those as soon as uh, we end the uh, program. All right. 
notes, brother. We're looking to hear from you on Friday then in that regard. Yes. All right. Well, I thank you all. Uh, just a couple resources to close out with. Um, I'll mention, uh, let's see, where, where will I start? So here we are on Monday. All right. So Tuesday, we have a um, study that we do at 7.30 p.m., uh, 7.30 p.m. Eastern, that is, and that's a study through the resurrection. We're looking at Isaiah 28 tomorrow night. So uh, we've already begun a little bit of discussion, but we're going to complete the discussion of Isaiah 28 and also maybe just kind of talking about some other Isaiah texts, texts from Isaiah that talk about resurrection. So we'll be doing a little bit of that tomorrow night. Um, then we have our next Preterist Power Hour, of course, will be on Friday. And that's about all we have online this week, I believe. Um, but again, I encourage you to be going through these resources. Uh, oh, I also have to make mention my wife and I began a podcast more recently called You've Got Mail, and we encourage you to check that out. You could go to Apple Podcasts. You can go to Spotify. Uh, you can find us on Buzzsprout. There's a bunch of different ways you can find us. Uh, but we encourage you. We did a part two, our second podcast together, and I know you'll be edified by that resource. So um, that's what I have for you. Uh, I will provide a link to the most recent resource I've obtained is this new uh, YouTube channel called Better Understanding the Bible. And uh, hopefully we'll find out, a little, find out a little bit more about Dallas. And if he wants to join us for our study and our sessions, we'll invite him to do so. And uh, that being said, uh, thank you for being here, Edward. Thank you, Zach, for being here with me. I pray that uh, this was an encouraging and edifying morning, uh, helping you get a handle on the mission uh, that's ahead of us, Better Understanding God's Covenant and what he's doing through that covenant to benefit his people and the world around us. Let's go ahead and close out with a, a benediction. It's Monday. I often do common prayer on Monday mornings. So I want to bless you with the benediction we prayed uh, at the closing of our common prayer. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders that he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Amen. And that door will be opened Friday at 1030 a.m. God bless and go in peace.